God, I will talk loudly. Uh, if, please, if you can't hear in the back, let me know and I'll try to use the microphone. But I think you can probably hear me, can you? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I'm here to talk about, well, first of all, I should say it's a great privilege to me as an amateur to be in the presence of all these professionals. And I hope you'll have uh, patience with me uh, as an amateur. I want to talk about the uh, was more Nave project uh, and two years of, uh, of work in, 19, in 2016 and 2017 of community archaeology uh, and there's a joint project of uh, Lismore Parish Church and the Lismore Historical Society of which I'm the archivist. Uh, first of all I must emphasize uh, on, the, on the left here is the Her Historical Society and on the right the Parish Church. Uh, in 2016 we were funded by the Lottery uh, some uh, uh, funding by Historical Ground in Scotland and a little bit by Argyll and Butte Council. Uh, in all of the work we've been doing on this more, we have the, the great support uh, and supervision of Argyll Archaeology and Claire Ellis is here to answer your questions, the ones I can't answer. <laughs> Claire's been an enormous uh, asset to us on the island. Uh, in 2017, we had funding from the Society of Antiquaries for Scotland. Thank you, David. Um, these have got a bit muddled up. Uh, PowerPoint does this, I don't know why. But anyway, the Hunter Trust gave us some money. Uh, from the Strathmartin Trust, we had funding for uh, looking at the bones, which we'll talk about later on. And also we had some, uh, every year we get some money from the McDougall McCallum Trust of America, which is a diaspora organization the McDougals and uh, a particular McDougal and a particular McAllen uh, went to America and ended up together in Minnesota and married each other and prospered mightily and every year they gave us some funding. Uh, those are our sponsors and we're really grateful for, for their support. <coughs> I want to take you to the Isle of the S'more. Uh, if you've looked at the map outside, uh, which I think is taken in winter, You'll see everywhere else is brown except the Green Isle of Lismore. <laughs> and it's the Green Isle of Lismore because it's a lump of limestone. Very, very unusual in Scotland. Popped up during the, the movement of the Great Glen. It's almost entirely limestone. And it's a very hard, rocky island apart from this bay in the north, uh, um, Port Ramsey. Uh, and it's obviously right in the middle of the, of the Great Glen at the south of the Great Glen. This is the background of what we're looking at. First of all, uh, we know there was a Celtic church, well, we're pretty certain there was a Celtic church uh, uh, establishment on the island in the 7th, 6th century. Uh, we're not sure, we know, of course, what happened to Iona. We're not sure what happened to Lismore. We do have a lot of Norse place names on Lismore, but we don't have any documentary evidence of the impact of the Norse. Again, uh, following on from that, uh, if you look at the documentation, I've uh, forgotten the name of the, 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 the document, but it's a, an English document which lists all the Chaldee foundations in Scotland, uh, and there was a substantial one in Argyll, and it may well have been on this moor. <coughs> but if we move on then to what's important for today, in 1190 there was the foundation of the Diocese of Argyll on this moor, and that was by the division of the Diocese of Dunkeld. Uh, and important to say, why did they put uh, the Cathedral of Argyll on this moor? Well, uh, we think of it now in terms of roads and land, but in fact, it's not an isolated place. It's on the seaway and at the centre of the ruling MacDougall territory. The MacDougalls at that time, before they made a mistake of not supporting Robert Bruce, um, they were the dominant uh, family. Uh, and there are two stone castles uh, from the uh, 1200s, 1300s on this moor built by the MacDougalls and their cathedral. Uh, I mentioned that the isolation, of course, is not isolated. This moor here in the mouth of, the, uh, of Loch Linney is very strategic for northward movement, for westward movement, and it's right at the centre of the uh, the MacDougall, uh, 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 the strength of the MacDougalls at, at that period. This is, this is the timeline of what we're looking at. Around about 1250, uh, the building of the choir, the chancel, 
And the, the question there, which touches on the first talk today, was there a, an original church, existing church that they built upon? Obviously, if Maluak, our saint in the Celtic period, uh, had his church there, it would have been a, a wooden church and we wouldn't expect anything to be there, but there may well have been uh, something more substantial from the Chaldee period. We don't know. Uh, we later than 1250, we think, the building of the nave. Later on yet, we know from the archaeology, the building of the West Tower. But by the 16th century, the docu documentation makes it clear that the cathedral was ruined. We don't really know what happened between the 16th century and 1750. Did it stand ruined all that period? Because we know in 1750 that the choir, or the chancel, whatever you want to uh, refer to it, was remodeled as the parish church, which is today. And it was then remodeled again in 1900, which was a, in some ways quite a brutal Victorian remodeling. Um, what are the aims of, of what we were doing? First of all, to improve public access to the western end of the cathedral. There, there, there was a nave there. Uh, you had to go over a rickety wall to get there to look at it. Uh, to improve the public access, to improve the appearance of the area, because it was a rubbish tip. tip. Uh, and then, uh, by archaeology, by excavation, to assess the condition of what was there. And then, uh, longer term, and more, more demanding, to ensure the long term preservation and interpretation of the cathedral. Because up until uh, two years ago, uh, visitors could not uh, understand what they were seeing. And those are the aims, what are the questions, the actual questions that we applied ourselves to? What are the dates of the, each component of the cathedral? Uh, where was the entry to the nave? Was, it, was there really a west tower? And uh, can we get some idea of what it looked like? What were the archaeological, architectural rather, details of the building? And maybe something about how the the ruin of the nave was used after the after the Reformation. So those are the questions we set. Uh, what did we start with? What was there? This is the this is the the chancel of the choir of the cathedral today. This photograph was taken in 2015. I have to say that the building has deteriorated quite badly in the three or four years since then. The harling is coming off, the roof is needing replaced, and uh, the walls are extremely, extremely wet. So it's a, not a particularly good situation. But you can see the medieval buttresses. Uh, this, you are sitting in the ancient graveyard. Um, if we look inside, um, people are very surprised to find there are, in spite of the Reformation, in, in spite of the bashing around <coughs> of the building, there are still quite a lot of uh, medieval details, including the sedilia where the priests sat for mass, and the, here is the piscina where they washed up their cups. <laughs> and also what's interesting is that you can detect what the colour of the painting was. Uh, you can see traces. We had an expert came and told us uh, uh, precisely what uh, pigments there would be on, on these details. Um, and the, those, well, the, what, what is exposed within the chancel is covered with mason's marks. Um, <coughs> and this one in particular is interesting. The M on a line uh, recurs in Akidan Castle. Um, uh, and, and it was actually built slightly, we think, built slightly later, which gives us some clues as to uh, ab about timing. This is the west door, and I was interested uh, from our first talk, uh, the, the, the church is slightly puzzling in the fact that we've got this very, very massive wall at the west end, uh, rather than uh, people have interpreted that there was a wooden screen between the chancel and the nave. Well, it doesn't really look like that to me, which makes me wonder whether the, 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 the chancel choir was built first as a separate church, and then they built the nave on later. And that's, that's for discussion. 
And we have still have a certain um, amount of uh, medieval carving. Here is one, in one of the doorways, uh, the carving of what's probably one of the bishops of Argyll. In the graveyard, we, have, we had some very nice uh, West Highland grave slabs. The, the top one is a detail from an Iona stone. You can see the, uh, the hounds biting the stag and above. Well, it's a bird. Is it, the, is it a, a representation of a goose in terms of the Holy Ghost? There are a lot of discussion about that. Below, typical sword stone. And uh, in 2015, before we started all of this, we lifted uh, eight, the eight scheduled uh, grave slabs and uh, placed them in, 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 uh, in this uh, structure, Argyle Green Oak, for, for their protection. And in fact, this is now, has now become a favorite picnic site for people coming through the island, sitting on the, on the bench here. So that's the background. Uh, this is what the nave looked like in 2015. I think you can see it was not in good condition. If you see the little rickety ladder in the corner, that's the only way you could get onto the site. Um, but totally neglected, uh, dump, dumping ground, uh, and not very promising. But we do know that the, uh, the nave had been dug in the 1950s by Brown and Duncan. Uh, but they, although it is, it is uh, published in the Journal of Ecclesiological Studies, I think, uh, it's not particularly well documented. So what, what we were doing was, was going back to their, uh, uh, to their dig and, and evaluating. This is what the nave looked like. And this, is, this gives you an idea of the, the scheduled area is the, round, is the red area. Here is the, the chancel here. This is where we were digging in the nave. Uh, and this is the ancient graveyard here. Uh, so it's a scheduled area, so there's very restricted activity. <coughs> Um, this, is the, this is the findings from the Brown and Duncan uh, dig in the 1950s, uh, indicating that well, we, there was a wall placed here probably in the 1700s, and obviously anything on the east side of that wall has been destroyed. Uh, what they found was uh, the, 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 uh, the foundations of the, 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 the west end of the nave, and possibly a tower. Uh, but when you look at the documentation, and um, perhaps Claire can answer to this, there's not really, it's not really clear where they dug, and, and uh, we suspect that these are actually the, the, uh, their original, uh, we think these are the original recorded trenches. Uh, one over here in the corner, one uh, in spreading into the tower, this part of the tower, we don't quite know how they knew about the full extent of the, the <coughs> remains if they hadn't actually dug more than this. Uh, it's a scheduled monument, obviously, so in uh, 2016 we were restricted to reopening the supposed Brown and Duncan trenches, three, three trenches, and, for example, all fencing post holes to be pre-excavated. I find this so amusing that we, uh, Claire had to hang over us while we, and yet uh, this land's being farmed. So I'm not sure quite where we are on this, but anyway, in 2017, we were allowed to explore the remaining walls. And, and here's the team. This is a, a large part of the set of volunteers. You can see Claire in the middle, and uh, Mark Thacker. Uh, are the people who are in the, who are in the room today, Mary Ann and Andy, for example, uh, a, 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 a volunteer team, partly from the island and partly from further further uh, uh, on the mainland. The first priority, of course, was to get access. How do we get onto the site? Uh, we wouldn't be allowed uh, under health and safety to climb over the rickety stair. So first first priority was to get the area gated. <laughs> And in 2016, you can see these are the three trenches that, uh, that, that we dug. We're looking west uh, towards the tower, and uh, the, the trench here is in the middle of the, uh, of the nave, uh, one on the uh, north side and one on the west. <coughs> on the 
South side. And what did we? What, what were the results? Uh, we revealed first of all the west wall of the nave. Here is the west wall, as you can see, and you can see uh, one of the walls of the uh, of, of the of the um, of the tower. The we know we knew from the uh, the, the Brown and Duncan uh, study that the uh, the walls of the nave were parallel, were continuous con continuity. Uh, with, with the with the chancel, so we knew we, we knew where we were going, and here we get you can see the uh, this is Mark Thacker, uh, and, and here is the here is the west wall of the nave, and of course that tells you because the tower is starting here that there is not a west door, there was a tower there. Uh, what uh, beside Mark you can see the, the the base of the of the wall, which is in uh, this. Uh, more of a sandstone I'll be talking about. Here is Claire recording that drip layer on the west wall. Uh, and here are the, the drawings which have resulted from that. You can see uh, the yellow being the sandstone. I'll talk about that in a moment. And here is the tower and it gives you some idea of, of the thickness of the walls. Now what I would say uh, uh, we as amateurs, those of us who are volunteers, were quite astonished at the quality of the drawing work, the detailed drawing work done by, uh, uh, by, by Mary Ann and Andy as well as by Claire. This was a great revelation to me, uh, this detailed recording, resulting in uh, this sort of, well smudged from being out of doors, this sort of uh, precise recording of the walls, which then of course can be turned into these Rather beautiful drawings, uh, which give a, a clear idea of the of the masonry. So that was the west wall of the uh, west end of the nave, uh, and here is the north wall of the nave. Uh, no, no, this is this is the north wall. This is the tower. We're into the tower. Now, when we dug the north wall of the tower on, in 2016, there. It, 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 Quite honestly, it didn't look as if the tower was strong enough to, to, to be of any great height. And Claire had some serious doubts about whether it was a tower at all. When we continued the digging in 2017, it, it became clear, yes, it was a tower, but certainly there's some doubt about whether it would be of any great height, possibly even a, a wooden structure on top of a, 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 a stone foundation. But certainly there is a tower, we don't know, uh, quite what, what it would be like. On the, we talked about the fact that uh, there is no west uh, entry. Uh, this is the entry, this is the west, this is the south wall of the nave, rather better preserved. You can see the, the quality of the masonry there. You can see the foundation stones on the left. <coughs> and here is, uh, you can see here, that the entry, you can see the, uh, the threshold stone, you can see the the, the, the foundation down here, this is the entry in the south. So we were able to establish, yes, Brown and Duncan were right, the entry to the nave was from the south, uh, south door. Now, um, Brown and Duncan said that they thought that the north wall of the nave had been uh, uh, robbed. So uh, I was given the job of finding this uh, north wall and spent a whole week digging and found, yes, there wasn't a north wall. You can see a fairly, a fairly dis well, I had a picture of a fairly disgruntled myself digging this. Um, perhaps it. There you are, there I am. Fed up. Uh, except it, all these people had, these had the exciting things like finding <coughs> door entries and investigating towers, and I was digging a hole. Um, interestingly enough, what we were able to do to, to, to interpret the fact that this is the collapse of that wall, all the good stone had been taken out, and you can see there's a lot of mortar there. Uh, so, so yes, there, there is no north wall in that, in that area. So what are the results of, of, of the two years? First of all, we largely confirmed Brown and Duncan's findings. The north wall of the nave was robbed out, as I said a moment ago. 
The entrance is on the south wall. Uh, within the uh, nave, there was a, a later wall, and we have no idea what that, whether that's uh, perhaps even someone using the nave as a place to keep to keep animals after the Reformation. But anyway, there there's a, a mystery, mysterious wall within the nave. The later tower did exist, but may, may not have been tall uh, because the, the masonry looks inferior. But, on, but sadly, the mortar is generally deteriorated. And uh, most of the fine sandstone detail has gone, has disappeared. In terms of dating, am I, are you still hearing me all right? In terms of dating, uh, Mark Thacker has taken uh, uh, mortar samples to do this clever carbon-14 dating. This is the remains of the charcoal uh, which was used for burning the lime, which, of course, in the west of Scotland and the north of Scotland, that was the norm. Not so easy in the south where, actually, even in the early days, they were using coal to burn <coughs> lime. So we're still waiting for the results. But what's, what's really interesting is that, as well as uh, being able to look at the, uh, the date from the carb radiocarbon uh, results, you can actually detect what wood was actually burned. We know that, that, that uh, uh, oak wood was actually used to burn uh, the lime for the, for the, for the, for the nave. Uh, this is a bit puzzling because there's, there, there isn't oak on Lismore. Ash is the woodland there because it's, it's limestone. So that's another thing to be thinking about. Here's Mark uh, sampling the mortar. Uh, and what, what they do is they take the mortar sample and then they do very thin sections and uh, get enough recovery of carbon to be able to date. So we're waiting for that with in great anticipation. Now the nave and the tower, as well as the chancel, they're built from uh, this local limestone, the dull radiant ancient limestone, too old to have fossils. And, but the details of the building, the windows and the door detailing, drip courses and so, so on, were constructed from quite Morven sandstone. So uh, you ask a question, where is it? Uh, where is the, we've seen some of it already on the drip course, but where is it? Uh, some has been left on the site. The top, a piece of moulding, I think we, we Consider it could be a, a could be door molding or window molding, and these pieces uh, left on the site are definitely look as if they're window window molding. So this is the Morven white sandstone. You can see the the colour better on the clean piece on top. But when we were oh all right I'll hurry all right. Uh, when we were in, during our dig, we also found pieces like this. Uh, you can see down below other pieces of, of the, the sandstone. Um, this is nail head, uh, dated to that period, definitely, around about 1250. I'll go quickly now. Um, but there's sandstone everywhere. Obviously been robbed out, uh, and it appears in walls. And this was a detailed study done by Noelle Odling, where she was looking at the incidence of the sandstone in walls all around the church, and you can see how it had been displaced. Uh, this gives clues to what the building looked like. If you look at p uh, buildings in the area built by the McDougalls of the same period, we have, in this case, Dogtooth, which I think is a <coughs> development of nail head, uh, detailing, and, uh, I'll go quickly, uh, similar uh, window and door moulding from that in the same sandstone from Morven. So this gives us uh, an idea of what our building may have looked like, some clues. Uh, this is our Hatton, again the same, McDougall's again built this, the same period, the same uh, uh, Morven stone. <coughs> uh, I'll do this very quickly, but we had a problem uh, of, of interpreting what this was all about. In the, uh, in the nave, we met an enormous amount of bone uh, uh, in a pile. Uh, as, we, as we came down to the nave, uh, it, it was lots of disarticulated bone, mixed uh, human and animal bone, uh, and mixed in with, uh, with, with, with actual burials. Bury, and this burial here is dated to about uh, 1560 or so. 
the result of uh, looking at the bones, Angela Boyle looked at the bone and was able to advise us on the condition of the bones, uh, lots of dif dietary deficiency, anemia, joint disease, a lot of dental stuff, but the bones were in very good condition uh, because of the lime, the lime soil. Similarly, lots of animal bones, mixed, mixed, uh, mixed animal, dog, sheep, cattle, predominance of dog bones, which we can talk about later. Um, and very quickly, we had open days, I have to rush now, too many slides. Uh, in, in true uh, style uh, as community ar archaeology, lots of open days, lots of uh, um, study by the, uh, th this is the, the session clerk checking up on us, uh, spreading the word, um, and an interpretation board uh, set up to explain to people what we had done. Uh, site cleared and fenced, back to normal at the end of our time. Um, I just want to, if we if patience just for two seconds, I just want to say, the what is the future for the nave? And the problem with, uh, you will all understand, the problem with this kind of thing is there are too many stakeholders. The church, the minister, the session, the congregation, trustees of the Church of Scotland who look after the, na the, the, the glebe, the long-term tenant of the glebe, they've had it for, they've had it for probably a hundred years, the Lismore Historical Society, the island community, who are interested in the building and its surround, HES, and funders. So many uh, stakeholders. <laughs> Leave it with you. <laughs>